Um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction, and then Aaron is going to uh, give a more extended one. Um, what I wanted to say, um, at the risk of perhaps embarrassing our guests this evening, is uh, I think it's important. Uh, I see that them sitting together on a stage, I think, is, a, is a, um, a, an, an important fact of, of um, what we're interested in doing here at school, which is um, elevating um, the discussion, the discourse of architecture, to the same level um, uh, uh, that we've been concerned about the design um, aspect here at the school. It's been known primarily as a, as a design school, a place that's been uh, run and taught primarily by practitioners. I think uh, um, those of us that have been practicing architecture for some years have um, continually looked at the work being um, produced by those that cover the other uh, aspect uh, that's included within the discipline of architecture, um, which is where architecture is critiqued, where it's analyzed, and then ultimately um, the ideas that are generated from that. I think the people that we have here really cross in and out of architecture. They could be qualified as uh, intellectual historians, uh, art historians, as well as uh, architectural uh, theoreticians. Um, I think the, um, the, the areas that they've been dealing with uh, that I know of um, over the last 15 years have continually redefined um, all that's currently being talked about in architecture. And I think that they've allowed some of us uh, enough insight to define new territory. Um, this will be, I think, the beginning of, of, a, of a new direction of the school in including people like this uh, as part of uh, the program here, which I think is critically important uh, to the generation of ideas, the interrogation of ideas, and ultimately the testing of those ideas, um, which I believe is the building itself. Okay. Here's Aaron Betsky. Thank you, Michael. Um, this event is uh, part of a course which has been reviewing the constitution of the types and scenes of urban architecture uh, in reference to a specific historical and local context. Uh, it is a course which is entitled Architecture, Theatricality, and Monumentality in the Age of Revolutions, Paris, Berlin, 1780-1820. We can thank Tony for that title. Uh, and it has been taught by Tony Bidler and Kurt Forster as part of an ongoing uh, attempt uh, at a critique of the accepted modes and forms which we, uh, by which we make and look at the object of architecture. Now, in the event tonight, uh, we are going to pose what I think will be a series of questions, uh, a series of questions that uh, both Tony and Kurt have been raising in the class uh, in reference to these historical models and which I hope we will address today to the postmodern city. Uh, and in fact, we will ask, can the most postmodern city be read? Can we build mo monuments in the postmodern city? What are the texts and textures of urban memory? And can we build an architecture in, of, on, through, or against the city? The text of tonight then might be, what can be seen in the city? What is cited by what is seen? What scenes are excited by architecture in the city? What textures? or artifacts of architecture can be attempted in a metropolis ruined by the future. And the four people who will be addressing this or other questions, and I will uh, name them in the order in which they will speak, uh, will be Anne Bergren, a professor of classics at the University of California at Los Angeles, and also an instructor here at SciArc in uh, what, critical theories of architecture? How does that sound? Uh, and then we will hear from Anthony Vidler, who is a professor of architecture at Princeton University. And then we will hear from Emily Apter, who will talk about Wrong Way Street. And Emily Apter is an associate professor of Romance Languages at Williams College and is currently uh, writing a book, about to have published a book on fetishes. And finally, we will hear from Dr. Kurt Forster, uh, who is the director of the Getty Center for Advanced Studies in Art History and the Humanities, if that is the correct full title of the institution. 
so with that, I would like to, uh, oh, before I uh, ask Ann Bergman to start off, I, assuming that Cynthia Carlson is somewhere to be found, uh, there will be refreshments uh, offered after this event. So, uh, and they will be somewhere where Cynthia Carlson chooses to place them uh, towards the exit of this building. So watch for the uh, refreshments. And with that, I'd like to introduce Tony. Can you we get down to watch these slides? Because we're not going to be able to see the slides unless we get down. From sure. Here. Come on <laughs> down. <laughs> you stay here. Don't I come over there, I think, so that I can work the slides. Yeah. Oh, it's a bit <laughs> And Bergen. Oh, too big for me. There's a handout being passed around. If you don't have one, please raise your hand. It's coming. So I'll give that a minute. How about now? Do most people have one or have one to share? Okay, anyway, on I go. This is called the Museum of Venice, California. Here are my two muses tonight. First, one of the nine muses of ancient Greece, Polyhymnia, inspiring me as a classical philologist, and looking toward the second, a Venus of Venice on the half shell, herself looking backward toward Botticelli and the classical tradition of Venus types that he remembered, and looking forward toward the graffiti of the present Venice written upon her. Oh, I need. <laughs> I invoke them both as I consider our topic of the texts and textures of urban memory by comparing classical Greek thought about memory and its expression with the graphic and built objects, monuments, of my home city, Venice, California. I have found the place to be a museum that is a shrine and haunt of the muses. So after drawing a model of the muses' rhetorical powers for you, and of the classical distinction between memory and monument, I will show you a few of the houses the muses haunt there. That is, I'll tell you a few ghost stories to help you feel at home. First, memory. The first thing attributed to memory in the Western tradition is a gender. Memory, mnemosyne in Greek, is a female. She has intercourse, mixes, as the Greek expresses it, with Zeus, and from this union gives birth to the muses. Who is Zeus? He is the power of the human brain and the male genital, two powers often assimilated in Indo-European traditions, Mr. Brains and as balls, as it were. In his role as absolute ruler of the cosmos and in his most frequent epithet, father of humans and gods, he founds Western patriarchy, that is, rule of the father. So female memory mates with male mental, generative, and political power to produce nine daughters, the muses. The muses, transcendent knowledge and memory. In the figure of the muses, we find the radical relation that pervades Greek thought between memory and truth. Two texts in particular specify the muses' function. We should have the lights now so that the people can um, read their handouts, or maybe you already can. Uh, two texts in particular specify the muse's function. In the first, Homer's Iliad, right before a long catalog of the Greek forces that will tax the poet's memory, the poet invokes the muses. Speak now to me, muses, having homes on Olympus, for you are goddesses, and you are present beside, and you know all things. 
but we hear only the report, the kleos, the thing that is heard, and no, literally, have seen nothing. Who were the leaders of the Danaans and the chiefs? The multitude I could not tell or name, not if I had ten tongues, ten mouths, an unbreakable voice, a bronze heart within me, unless the Olympian muses, daughters of Aegis-bearing Zeus, remembered how many came under Ilion. By being present beside all things, the muses have seen and thus now know all things, and they remember and report to the poets what they know. Greek thus grounds knowledge in presence and sight, and defines memory as the capacity to represent that past point of view in any present place. Memory, via the muses, is thus the vehicle of truth, truth understood as a past place and past vision replaced in its totality, the whole catalog of Greek ships, in the present. But because they know all, the muses are able to tell not only the truth but also falsehood. The muses' rhetoric, truth and imitation of truth. When they hand the laurel staff of poetic inspiration over to the poet Hesiod, the muses address him saying, shepherds of the wild, base things of shame, bellies only, we know how to say many falsehoods like to true things, like to real things, and we know whenever we wish to, to utter the truth. By virtue of their transcendent knowledge of the truth, the muses are able to imitate it perfectly. And since they can do so whenever they want to, who can tell even whether this very instance of their speech, this declaration to Hesiod of their powers of speech, is an instance of one category or the other, of the truth or its perfect imitation? As the 60s ad for Clarol hair color used to say, only her hairdresser knows for sure. Only those who know what the muses wish in this situation can know which category they intend. The rhetorical status of any speech by the muses cannot be determined by anyone outside themselves, since, it's, since it depends upon a position of epistemological mastery and desire that no man can share. The speech of the muses remains an indecidable ambiguity of truth and its figuration. This power of ambiguity in the muses' speech derives from their gender. Early Greek thought attributes to the female this capacity to manipulate truth and imitation, their word for it is metis, and derives it from the woman's power to determine legitimacy and illegitimacy, the proper and the improper, in the area where it counts most, in a system of father rule, the reproduction of children. She can present a man with his own son or with a supposititious child. True paternity, only the woman knows for sure. Rhea, the mother of Zeus himself, is the founding instance. She presents to her husband Kronos not the child itself, but a matis, as it is called in Hesiod, a stone wrapped in swaddling clothes. Cronus swallows the trick, literally, in an attempt to prevent the birth of the son destined to usurp his power. And later, Rhea presents to him, now grown into an avenger, the son he had thought dead within himself. The female's control over legitimacy, propriety, ownership, and the own itself is a power of place, a power of putting one child, both value and sign, in the place of the other. This power of place is also gender determined. It derives from the capacity and the necessity to change places imposed upon the female by marriage exchange. In order for men to communicate with one another in systems of kinship and symbolic thought, they must prohibit incest, that is, they must move women from one place to another. Once placed, however, the female, like a building, is supposed to stay put but his Greek myth repeats in the figure of Helen above all. The place of the female is unstable, for speaking sign that she is, she can control her own place by moving it 
or by allowing an alien to enter it. This female mobility is the rhetorical power par excellence, the power of transference and of the trope or the turning of the literal into the figural, of fact into fiction, and we, as we shall see, of monument into memory and back again. It is this rhetorical power that the muses wield. They are present in all places and replace them all whenever and to whatever extent they wish. Knowledge and memory are a function of place in Greek, in Greek thought. The muses can leave a past event in the place of forgetfulness, Lethe, this is on your sheets, or they can replace the past in present again, making it aletheia, not forgetfulness, the Greek word for truth, or they can place in the mind of the poet pseudea homoia et tumoisin, falsehoods like to real things figurative facades of the past, and which they are doing in any instance of their speech, only the muses know. This model of the workings of mind and memory would seem to apply exclusively to sentient beings and their speech. To what extent can it apply to objects? How is it a model for the interrelation between objects and remembering minds that observe them? Are objects at home in a museon? With that, I turn to the section marked on your sheets. Mneme, hupomneme, memory and monument. I ask these questions because I began to think about this presentation tonight by wondering whether in the title, the texts and textures of urban memory, whether the phrase urban, urban memory meant not only memory of the city by people, but also memory by the city. The city as a built object itself remembering. Since from the point of view of the classical conception of memory, mneme, its word for memory as nomen actionis, action noun, is not properly a textual function. Texts do not literally remember but rather repeat what the muses remember and speak in and through them. Greek wants to distinguish between memory as a working of the human mind and memory as a product of that working in the form of an object or text. That is, between memory and reminder or monument. In Platonic philosophy, memory is a perpetual psychological process by which perception, aesthesis, or knowledge, episteme, mathema, is preserved, literally saved, when through practice, a new mneme, a new memory, continuously supplants the lethe, or forgetfulness, caused by the exodos, the going out of the old one, thus making the knowledge or perception seem to be the same. A graphic or built memory, however, is something different. When Tooth, inventor of grammata, things written or drawn, for grapho in Greek means both writing and drawing. When Tooth, inventor of grammata, presents his invention to the king of the Egyptians as pharmacon or drug of mneme, memory, that will, put, that will make his people more able to remember, the king disagrees. He replies that on the contrary, it will put lethe, forgetfulness, in the souls of those who learn it, because they will not practice the mneme memory inside themselves, but will instead trust in external graphics. Thus, the graphic, he claims, is not a pharmacon of mneme memory, but of hypomneme, reminding. Indeed, memory in the concrete form of writing and painting serves only to remind. Unlike living speech, these graphic mediums are dead, unable to express the mind at work, but only to say the same thing over and over again. This reminding, repeating sameness of memory in graphic or objective form is viewed ambivalently in Greek thought. The self-identity of the mnemeion, sign or type, stamped in wax, assures its unfalsifiability. And in the case of the mnema, the monument or memorial, the continual repetition of the name or the image of the dead person 
does provide a tangible, if only figural, presence to counteract the perpetuity of real absence. But the best compensation for death, in their view, comes not in concrete memorials subject to deterioration in time, but in the truly immortal Meneme, the unwritten memory that, as in the case of those Athenians whom Pericles eulogizes, will live forever in the mind, thus making a tomb of the whole earth. And the apparent wisdom of the written word, which cannot answer when questioned, is the bastard brother, the metaphor is Plato's, and the Eidolon, or ghost, of the, quote, living and breathing word of him who knows, unquote, the word that is, quote, written with knowledge in the soul of the learner. The graphic object, whether writing or painting, and the built object may function as reminders, whether for good or not, they may record memories and thus promote recall, but they do not themselves remember. From the point of view of classical Greek thought, there could be no urban memory, no memory by the graphic or the built object in any proper sense. For the object is not backed by the remembering mind, representing the fullness of its past knowledge. The object thus cannot be an instance of the speech of the muses and thus does not legitimately belong in or constitute a museon, the muses' home, haunt, and shrine. But now we turn to the Museum of Venice, California. But what of improper sense? What of figurative sense, whether in a sign, a monument, a painting, or in writing, humans figure their memories in the object, and so the object appears figur figuratively to be remembering. The object becomes a mimesis of memory, an imitation of the true human process. And when I look at this mimetic memory in the graphic and built objects of my city, Venice, California, I see there a degree of success in this metaphorical urban memory that would seem almost to surpass that of human consciousness. I wonder if the murals and buildings there are not uncanny, at the uncanny haunt of the muses' rhetoric just in their apparent ability to do what we know an inert object cannot really do, perform the muses' function of remembering as well as reminding, indeed of dismantling the distinction between memory and monument. In any case, I think I feel at home in Venice, California as a result of this obsessive this heimlich and unheimlich mnemonic drive that is embodied there everywhere. Now we can have the lights off and the slides on. Whoops. The muse persists. Can, I'm pushing forward. What happened? There we go. It starts with the Beaux-Arts arches of the St. Mark's Hotel on Windward Avenue that in the beginning recalled the architecture of Venice, Italy via what might be called the screen memories of Albert Kinney who founded our Venice in 1904. But once it recorded the mind of the founder, the building, like the area as a whole and like the written text when separated from its author, takes on a life and a mind of its own. In this way, the building remembers both its own authorship and its changes through time. This mural of 1941 in the Venice Post Office depicts the history of the resort development with the comprehensiveness of muses present at and thereby mindful of all its phases. In particular, we see the place as an amusement park complete with giant roller coaster and romantic couples, with the cultural aspirations of Kinney for the place, notable by being left in Lethe forgetfulness. Yeah. What you will see on what is left of the St. Mark's Hotel today is its own memory. 
itself as a building metaphorically remembering, indeed reflecting in a mural the view east it faces with Val's Pharmacy, the Foursquare Church, and the mountains in the distance. The subdivision of canals left when the rest were buried, filled up in 1929, continue to testify to the system of canals and walk streets that Kinney built for his American Venice. On their banks is a visible archaeology of Venice's architectural styles. From this craftsman style bungalow embodying all the time that has elapsed since Venice's first decade, to these modern day palazzos of the Holland Canal, recalling Kinney's desire to build his own version of Venice, Italy. From this modern recollection on the Howland Canal of Los Angeles's Spanish heritage, with its arched window looking out onto the canal, to this older, simple, but elegant Spanish style shell now gutted and looking off toward its next life. And from this old English instance on the Linney Canal of Los Angeles' love of the fantastic to its sedate modernist neighbor. Taken in together as one walks along the canals today, these buildings, like the human memory, but beyond its powers of simultaneous visualization, collapse the various phases of Venice's architectural past and present into a single composite picture. And indeed, the picture presented by the homes beside the canals today is not so far from the cultural and economic affluence envisioned by Kinney long ago. It is rather in the center of Venice, in the ghetto-like area of Oakwood, that we find that uncanny, quote, revisitation by a power thought dead, to quote Tony on the architecture of the uncanny, unhomely houses of the romantic sublime. In this case, the return in the heart of Venice of the real economic and apparent cultural poverty of America's unders underclasses that Kinney attempted to repress as Kronos swallowed the stone in his founding scheme. In the evident deterioration of its exterior and in the beaten up easy chairs on its front porch, this still lovely Victorian mansion at 554 Broadway tells the story of its fall from social superiority into who knows what cultural depths. Who knows? The interior of the house itself could say, if it, like the muses, only wanted to. Or so the four mailboxes beside the door intimate. This interior knowledge and knowledge of the interior is like that imputed to the female. And in looking at it, I feel the frustration of the male spectators like the male poet's position. I feel the ambiguity of being both builder or constitutor and less knowledgeable observer of the object. But decay is not the only story told by Venice's, Venice's ghetto. The mural of the Oakwood Wesley House opposite the Baptist Church on Broadway describes its mission of providing sport and community building. Its stylized and exaggerated shapes bespeak the energy and aesthetic confidence of the place. Indeed, the very evidence of danger and social decay is being aesthetically transformed in Venice, aestheticized with all the social ambiguity that entails, through self-consciously preserved urban memory. In an uneasy piece with its neighborhood, the Dixon Studio by Brian Alfred Murphy at Westminster and Sixth Street preserves every trace of its past experience as Ritz apartment house and storefront on the other side, preserves them for their aesthetic value. And indeed, I have to talk fast as we discovered when taking this photo that the past is about to be painted over since the owner can't get insurance for a building with graffiti in that neighborhood. The building preserves every trace of past experience while acknowledging ever-present danger in in its role of barbed wire, a derriere 
accompaniment of local self-preservation. To look at the place, you would never suspect the peaceful garden of pine trees within this hip inner city fortress. In these homes in Oakwood, and back too in the graffiti mark mural, marked mural of Venice on the half shell with which I started, we see the capacity of a built object to figure a knowledge and memory and rhetorical economy no less transcendent than that of the muses. For in changing, they embody their changes. Just by being a concrete monument rather than a living memory, they make the stages of their habitation, construction or mistreatment simultaneously visible. In losing, they gain something so that loss and gain can no longer be reliably differentiated. Such monumental memory is daunting, if not frightening, to the merely human consciousness in its ability to forget nothing, in its inability, therefore, to tell anything but the whole truth. And finally, two instances of Venice homes in which this muse function of the object is made overtly thematic. First, the Indiana Street Apartments of Frank Geary and the Hopper House by Brian Alfred Murphy. Here, Murphy has built the historical relation in an open passage so that we can see into the connection between apartment three in the Geary building and the new house Murphy built to go with it. And second, this house, mine, in which the 1986 edition by Morphosis is simply sutured to the 1920s bungalow. The inside of the bungalow could tell you, if it would, of its being gutted and restored by Brian Murphy in 1980. And the inside of the edition opens the doors of its upper floor out, not onto a surface, but to everywhere in the city outside. From these haunted homes of Venice, I have learned something that I did not realize before about the whole poetics of the muse's knowledge, memory, and speech. Namely, that it is a model, not so much as it might seem to be, of how the human mind feels itself knowing and remembering, but rather a model of how the human mind perceives the textual, tropic workings, forever real and figural, legitimate and bastard, stable and mobile, of the objects it constructs. To the human being, the built environment looks like the oral tradition, the speech of the muses, looked to the Homeric bards, like the repository of all knowledge and of all power to represent the truth. I uh, learned Greek a long time ago in English high school and have forgotten it. In the traditional city, antique, medieval, and renaissance, urban memory seemed easy enough to define. It was that image of the city that enabled the citizen to identify with its past and present as a political, cultural, and social entity. It was neither the reality of the city nor a purely imaginary utopia, but rather the complex mental map of significance by which the city might be recognized as home, as something not foreign, and as constituting a more or less moral and protected environment for daily life. Thence the privileged place of monuments as markers in the city fabric. Monuments that, as Alois Regal pointed out, owed their very name to their function as agents of memory. A monument, he said, in its oldest and most original sense, is a human creation erected for the specific purpose of keeping single human deeds or events alive in the minds of future generations. Something terrible has happened. Page 32 has disappeared.
and I have nothing to say. <laughs> That's never happened to me before. Here it is. The recognition of a network of such monuments, assembled in an equally recognizable hierarchy, was the basis for the cultural and political constitution of a city from antiquity to the Renaissance. But it's not so much the monuments themselves, triumphal arches or columns, that construct this meaning, so much as what they stand for. They, after all, are agents and instruments that operate like literary figures to say something by means of another. They act, in this sense, as tropes of the memory discourse they engender. Thus, Alberti will speak of Brunelleschi's dome for Santa Maria del Fiore as covering the people of Florence its vast size and shape standing for the population and their political and social unity. Brunelleschi's dome was in this sense a metaphor whose physical presence constantly reminded the population of their metaphysical bonds. It took its place at the center of a memory map that was continuously re-elaborated by the Florentine humanists that contained all the major monuments of the Republic. Such a map was, as Frances Yates has shown in her remarkable treatise on the art of memory, allied to similar aids to memory constructed by rhetoricians and philosophers from the time of Cicero. The orator Quintilian was quite precise in his description of how to remember, because as he says, when we return to a place after a considerable absence, we do not merely recognize the place itself, but remember things that we did there. Because of this, it's possible to use this property of places, pop, 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 to construct a kind of memory machine. Places, he says, are chosen and marked with the utmost possible variety as a spacious house divided into a number of rooms. Everything of note therein is diligently imprinted on the mind in order that thought may be able to run through all the parts without let or hindrance. Then what has been written down or thought of is noted by a sign to remind of it. This sign may be drawn from a whole thing as navigational warfare or from some word for what is slipping from memory is recovered by the admonition of a single word. Yeats describes the way in which more and more elaborate versions of these memory places were invented, fabricated, stored in the mind, used as agents of memory throughout the Middle Ages and Renaissance, leading to those strange half-real, half-imaginary loci named memory theaters or even, as in the case of a utopian theorist such as Campanella, utopias themselves. The relation between the real city and the utopian city is thereby mediated by a mental map that includes the real in order to imagine the unreal, the ideal, or simply that which has to be remembered. For our purposes tonight, however, this relationship, which determined to a great extent the nature of the Renaissance ideal city, becomes important at the moment when architects become aware of the possibility of transferring to the realm of reality that which they had imagined in their memory. That is to cut out of the fabric of the real city the sequences and places that constituted their memory maps of the city, to turn the city into a memory theater and make that theater accessible both to the inhabitants and equally important, importantly to visitors. The planning of the Rome of Sixtus V as a vast tourist city with all its monuments and memorials joined by significant paths or streets marks this true beginning of urbanism. Urbanism in this sense might be defined as the instrumental theory and practice of constructing the city as a memorial of itself. No, not yet, please. That's supposed to come right at the end. You blew it. You didn't see it. You forget it. Urbanism, in this sense, might be defined as the instrumental theory and practice of constructing the city as memorial of itself. The history of urbanism from the late Renaissance to the Second World War illustrates this definition clearly. The replanning of London by Wren and his fellow scientists and historians of the Royal Society, the replanning of Paris by Pierre Pat and the philosophic architects of the Enlightenment, the reconstruction of the same city by Baron Haussmann under the Second Empire the various model cities and their partial implementations envisaged by the modernist from Tony Garnier to Le Corbusier. All these perpetuate the myth of memory as installed for keeps, so to speak, in the heart of a metropolis that is finally rendered significant 
and speaking to its people. Of course, with modernism, a slightly different twist was given to the idea of the memory map as to the monuments that signified it. For the modernists made no secret of their desire to forget as well as to remember. To forget the old city, its old monuments, its traditional significance, which were all seen as being too implicated with the economic, social, political, and medical problems of the old world to justify memorialization. Such a forgetting would, in Le Corbusier's case, take the form of an erasure, literal and figural, of the old city itself, in favor of a tabula rasa that reinstalled nature as a foundation for a dispersed urbanism and made its monuments out of the functions of modern life, the bureaucratic skyscraper. Some have called this an anti-urban vision. I would advance the notion that its dialectical opposition in form rendered it no more than another vision of urbanism, symmetrical but counter to that of the 19th century. But while the models proposed for the modern herbs departed very little in form and spirit from those of earlier centuries, even as in, uh, even as in La Viradieuse, maintaining that central reference point, the body, as organizing motif and principle, modernism did introduce a profoundly destabilizing concept into the general idea of memory. Forgetting, after all, is a more complex activity than simply not remembering. It implies a number of procedures from the prolectic projection explored by Proust, who ever nostalgic for a moment that points forward to an event that never happened, founded his search for lost time on a systematic process of forgetting what happened to the nihilation described by Nietzsche and elaborated by Sartre that is the foundation of an existential comprehension of the self and the world. Sartre will thematize this in the celebrated image of the Parisian cafe. Questioning the relationship of negative judgment to non-being, Sartre systematically demonstrates that in fact non-being is not a result of a negative judgment, for example, the self-conscious nihilation of something into nothing, but rather that non-being brings into being a negative judgment. Non-being, that is, is the essential presupposition for a negative judgment. Thus, the story of Pierre, who is not in the cafe. Sartre arrives at the cafe for a 4.15 appointment with Pierre, a quarter of an hour late. Pierre, who is always punctual, is not in fact there. And Sartre realizes this. Is this realization, a negation, Pierre isn't there, founded on judgment or intuition? Certainly the cafe is a fullness of being. Its patrons, says Sartre, its tables, its booths, its mirrors, its light, its smoky atmosphere, its sounds of voices, rattling saucers, and the footsteps which fill it attest to the cafe's fullness of being. Likewise, Pierre, somewhere else, but we don't know where, is also a fullness of being. But in all perception, there must be a figure on a ground. So if all is fullness of being, there can be no ground and therefore no perception. The cafe as Sartre enters it is immediately reorganized with respect to his search for Pierre on entering as such a ground. This organization, he says, of the cafe as the ground on which I want to see Pierre is an original nihilation. Each element of the setting, a person, a table, a chair, attempts to isolate itself, to lift itself upon the ground, constituted by the totality of the other objects, only to fall back once more into the undifferentiation of the ground. It melts into the ground. For the ground is that which is seen only as an addition, that which is the object of marginal attention to me. Thus the original nihilation of all the figures which appear and are swallowed up in the total neutrality of a ground is the necessary condition for the appearance of the principal figure, which is here the person of Pierre. That is, you go into the cafe, the cafe isn't there because Pierre has to be seen against the cafe. But while all this is given to the intuition and would be, so to speak, fulfilled as ground if the solid appearance of Pierre was there, organizing the cafe around his presence, Pierre is, in fact, not there. His absence is everywhere in the cafe, a cafe that remains a ground in the face of his absence 
presenting this figure which slips constantly between my look and the solid real objects of the cafe, and which is precisely a perpetual disappearance. Pierre raising himself as nothingness on the ground of the annihilation of the cafe is offered to Sartre's intuition as the apprehension of a double negation, the expectation of seeing Pierre, the subsequent adjustment of the cafe as ground, its primary annihilation, causes the absence of Pierre, which happens as a real event, and thereby a second negation. Pierre absent haunts this cafe and is the condition of its self-nihilating organization as ground. This description of the double nihilation precipitated by expectation within a world that potentially exhibits the fullness of being, but which turns out to be haunted by absence instead, seems to me to operate, if not philosophically, certainly in a literary way, as a parable of the dislocation of memory in the modern city. That the models of urbanism proposed by architects of the modern movement seem to ignore such a process only indicates the extent to which they were the prisoners of the classical belief that judgment precipitates positive or negative being, and not the other way around. One could say indeed that the modern architect entered the old city much in the same way as Sartre, the De Magot Café, in the expectation of finding modernism there. They were certainly late, they knew this, and they were cer certain that modernity preparing itself for more than a century must be already there. With this expectation, they regarded the old city, which immediately under this expectation gaze organized itself into a ground, ready to receive modernity as figure. The city first nihilated, remained in a constant state of nihilation in the face of a modernity, which as we now know, was never really there, save as an absent presence, haunting the old ground as Pierre's haunted the cafe. Founded thus on a double nihilation, it was no accident that modernism, where precipitated by the anxious architect, was instantly seen as the not modern, or the modern not there, itself old and already obsolescent before its life had begun. The modernist, entering the cafe of the old city, sought the solid presence of the future, a future that was not there because already past, and in its absence, the modernist attempt to state it in terms that would anticipate its nihilation by future objections or arguments against it. Thence the intersection of urbanism and modernism. Both employed the figure, literal and metaphorical, of projection, a mechanism learned from cartography and applied by architecture since the reinvention of perspective. The transformation of the perspective city to the figure ground city from the Renaissance city to the modernist city, did, however, involve a rupture of a certain sort. Where the perspective city proposed a delicate balance between two equally significant fullnesses of being, the city as such and its monuments, the one subsumed in the mental envelope of the other, the figure ground city of modernism was founded on the erasure of two fullnesses of being, that is to say, the presence of the absence to put it in terms that Peter Eisenman would recognize. The angry discomfort felt at this double absence, the letdown felt by Sartre because Pierre, who was always punctual, was not in fact there, is, I believe, involved in the impossible nostalgia of postmodern attempts to retrieve fullness of being by retrospective memory, by a process much like that hazarded by Proust, the nostalgia for a moment which points forward to an event that never happen. But this attempt is profoundly altered by the very negations of modernism. The old city, doubly negated, presents itself to the postmodernist as a haunting absence, not a haunting presence. The invention of a supposed presence to stand in for this ghost can hardly result in more than a third negation, that what is being proposed as presence is neither the absence of the modern nor the presence of the past. It can't be the absence of the modern for obvious reasons. It can't be the presence of the past because the past has no presence save in a retrospective memory that searches for something in the past that would have predetermined the future. Somewhat in the same way that the predictions of a scientist in the time of Copernicus might now be discovered by a historian as fixing the date of a return for a comet 
that indeed has returned, but by virtue of that has, is now in the past. Shaky ground on which to build a secure domestic future for mankind. Rather than such an attempt that with Paul de Man we should characterize in Nietzschean terms as the endlessly repeated gesture of the artist who does not learn from experience and always falls into the same trap in the allegory of errors constituted by postmodernism, I would suggest that we are in the fact of en in the process, we are in fact in the process of entering a very different cafe than one faked up to look as if it had always been there. This cafe I would describe in very similar terms to that of Sartre. Indeed, it looks about the same, perhaps a little more time-worn. The chairs are falling apart, the waiters long past their prime. It's a cafe definitely in decline and with the air of having seen better years. The food tastes stale. But of course, we enter it without expectation, crossing the threshold with no sense that we are going to find anything there. Certainly, if Pierre was expected, we've long given up hope that he would ever arrive. Certainly, too, we cannot be sure that Pierre was ever there. Perhaps he was no more than the fiction of our imagination. And when he said he was punctual, he was probably lying. Our lack of expectation is countered by the cafe, which rises up towards us in implacable reinforcement that we're right not to expect anything, that nothing here is of any particular interest. Like the narrator of Peter Hanke's novel, Across, we enter this room simply to relax and not be noticed, to become ourselves ground in the ground, to go to ground. After a day of working alone, it does me good to, do, to go to some cafe, if only because of the place names that are dropped here and there in the table conversation. Then in my weariness, I manage to show that glimmer of interest in everything around me that makes me, or so I believe, inconspicuous. No one, I feel sure, will turn to me, let alone turn against me. When I leave, no one will talk about me, but my presence will have been noticed. Something of this sensibility, one that I don't have the time to develop more fully tonight, marks a number of cultural observations of the contemporary city. I'm thinking of the last picture show, or more recently, of true stories, or more melodramatically, Clockwork Orange, or more recently, Blade Runner. In this city, where suburb, strip, and urban center have merged indistinguishably into series of states of mind, and that is marked by no systematic map that might be carried in the memory, we wander surprised, but not shocked, by the continuous repetition of the same, the continuous movement across already vanished thresholds that leave only traces of their former status as places. Amidst the ruins of monuments no longer significant because deprived of their systematic status and often of their corporeality, walking on the dust of inscriptions no longer decipherable because lacking so many words, whether carved in stone or shaped in neon, we cross nothing to go nowhere. This sensibility, so far removed from Sartre's optimistic nihilism in presence, we might term post-urbanism. Could I have my two slides now, please? On the right, you see urbanism, and on the left, post-urbanism. But certainly after such an urbanism, post-urbanism stands clearly distinct from other sensibilities of the fragmentary, the chance, and the marginal. Previous sensibilities of the edge, whether Baudelaire's banlieue or Polonaire's zone, have had as their referent a positive urbanism, one that threatened the edge and would wish to swallow it within a system of coherences. The edge for the symbolists and the early modernists was a place of release, a potential for another order, whether of nostalgic remains, destructive forces, or difference, but one defined in an urbanistic structure. But none of this kind of threshold quality is found in the post-urban sensibility. Rather, the margins have entirely invaded the center and disseminated its focus. In, indeed, is hard to find, under the arches and along the walls of down by law, or in the mental slippages of blue velvet. In this last film, 
the total breakdown of a determined sense of self and the other is marked by the continuous sliding between states of terror, amusement, and sheer banality. I would hope tonight that we could discuss this state of post-urbanism with reference to the forgetting that it demands of urbanism. Thank you. I haven't talked to an architecture audience before, so I don't have slides, and you'll help me with examples afterwards. Um, this is called Wrong Way Street, which is a play for anyone who hasn't read Walter Benjamin's One Way Street, um, a, 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 a play on words. In his A Berlin Chronicle, Walter Benjamin employs two contradictory tropes of memory, the map and the maze. The map is used as a comforting metaphor for the points of orientation, the privileged point de repère, or points of reference, of a life, his own. Interestingly enough, his autobiography refuses representation as a map of just any space. The military map of reflection and recollection is illuminated with dots on an urban territory. The subjectivity of the self is centered in a city. And this is a long quote. He says, I have long, indeed for years, played with the idea of setting out the sphere of life, the bios, graphically on a map. First I envisaged an ordinary map, but now I would incline to a general staff's map of a city center, if such a thing existed. Doubtless it does not, because of ignorance of the theater of future wars. I have evolved a system of signs, and on the gray background of such maps, they would make a colorful show if I clearly marked in the houses of my friends and girlfriends, the assembly halls of various collectives, from the debating chambers of the youth movement to the gathering places of the communist youth, the hotel and brothel rooms that I knew for one night, the decisive benches in the tear garden, the ways to different schools, and the graves that I saw filled the sights of prestigious cafes whose long forgotten names daily crossed our lips, the tennis courts where empty apartment blocks stand today, and the halls emblazoned with gold and stucco that the terrors of dancing classes made almost the equal of gymnasiums, gymnasiums of classrooms. Benjamin's map describes a plenitude of identity. Place names, the debating chambers, the tear garden resonate with presence. Sites of absence are only provisionally vacant. Even graves are evoked in their expect expectancy of being filled. But it is perhaps in this cemetery that the me memory map begins to lose its confident sense of direction. After reaching these, long, these unmarked graves, the names of the cafes become long forgotten. Forgetting begins to displace commemoration, thereby decentering and destabilizing the self. Before we know it, we are no longer following a map. Rather, we are lost in a maze. Paris, Benjamin continues, taught him the art of straying that had shown its first traces, and I'm quoting him, shown its first traces in the labyrinths on the blotting pages of my school exercise books. Berlin, a city of maternal burdens, nursemaids, governesses, mama herself, offered him erring paths, Those, that's his term, paths on which prostitutes crossed, thereby sending a thrill of dépaysement and transgression into the spinal cord of his bourgeois class origins. Paris again seduced him not into an orgy of remembrance, but rather into an epiphany of forgetting, a vision of, quote, so many entrances into the maze. And this is another quote recalling Sartre's cafe, it's the same one. Um, now on the afternoon in question, I was sitting inside the Café de Magot at Saint-Germain-des-Prés, where I was waiting, I forget for whom. So he becomes Pierre in that sense. Suddenly, and with compelling force, I was struck by the idea of drawing a diagram of my life, and knew at the very moment exactly how it was to be done. With a very simple question, I interrogated my past life, and the answers were inscribed, as if of their own accord, on a sheet of paper that I had with me. A year or two later, when I lost this sheet, I was inconsolable. 
I have never since been able to restore it as it arose before me then, resembling a series of family trees. Now, however, reconstructing its outline in thought without directly reproducing it, I should rather speak of a labyrinth. For Benjamin, the city is a lost text of the self, replaced by a mnemonic trope, the labyrinth, which itself turns, or rather veers, from truth to error, much like the famous deconstructive turn. And there's a book on deconstruction called The Deconstructive Turn. According to Paul Dumont's reading of rhetoric, tropes are always already turns, from tropus, as Anne mentioned, meaning turn, manière, from tropisme, the most primitive form of plant life turning towards the sun, and aux enfants, Le Corbusier evoked that as well. Figuration itself is a process whereby language disguises the original error on which all systems of signification are founded. Taking his cue from Nietzsche's famous argument that, quote, truths are illusions whose illusionary nature has been forgotten, metaphors that have been used up and have lost their imprint, and that now operate as mere metal, no longer as coins, Paul Dumont elaborates a theory of semantic speculation, a term I am using in the sense of market risks on valued property, specularity, or the consciousness of mirrors, doubles, and false copies, and the process of self-deception.